So yeah. see over here. So, <laughs> so um, I mean, first of all, congratulations on all the stuff going on today and right now, the buzz, the positivity, there's reviews coming out, it all looks good. Yeah, so far so good. Um, thanks. Yeah. Um, now and I mean, we'll get into it because I'll record an intro for this. Anyway, we talked um, months ago. I think it was like the beginning of the pandemic, actually. We, we, we talked, uh, had an episode of this show where we talked very broadly about the show because you, you hadn't taped all the episodes yet. Uh, there wasn't a lot of information out to the public about exactly what the show was going to be. Um, and I think it was really exciting to people, but now we get to really break down because now as this episode is releasing, this is the day that people first are able to see the show. We're putting this out on the 25th. So yeah. this is going to be uh, our first chance to really uh, go all nerdy and break the whole thing down. Um, so I hope you don't mind because I went really nerdy with my notes. Oh, you did. <laughs> now you've seen them, right? I did. I've seen I've seen uh, episodes one, three, five, saw, or three, four. Is that what they? Said? I think it was one, three, and four. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. What'd you think? Uh, you know, I am just so impressed with it because really, oh, good. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it it, it feels like a really hard, tricky uh, blend of different types of shows to pull off, right. um, and you never knew what it was going to be until you know we could see it for ourselves now we all have and it's just such a great combination of everything that we enjoyed about the first show but then bringing it into a totally different thing so congratulations cool. thank that. you i know i'm like pathetically asking any reporter i talk to like did you like it you don't have to <laughs> just tell me the truth because no one's seen it you know <laughs> except for executives and you know me and right so it's always a little has it, has it been stressful? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've been thinking about this. Like, has it been stressful for you to be behind all this and then for the delay just to keep dragging this thing out to wait, to wait, and wait till people can actually see this? Um, has it been something where you get over it after a while or does the stress just become worse? nervous like the week something comes out for the first you know because i've done this a couple times before like the week um that you know your show premieres or whatever you're always like a little nervous like oh am i just gonna get like horrible reviews and um <laughs> and feel really bad about myself but um yeah i mean what's tricky about this one is other stuff that i've done has not had the kind of like anticipation that this has because it's a you know it's based off the original show so you know that's a blessing that i think it'll, it'll bring a lot of eyes to it but it also puts pressure on it and it also you know reading comments on stuff i feel like you know they're they're just leading up to it and especially before trailers came out and it was just announcements about about they were doing a Save by the Bell reboot. It's just like, of course, all the comments are like, why? What a terrible idea. Who would do right. this? Disgusting. So, you know, you're excited for, you're you're anxious for people to actually see the, what, what it is, but, you know, you're also nervous that you, you want people to like it. Yeah, and there's always going to be that segment of people who are just waiting to bash it. Yeah, of, I think so, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, and just to jump ahead, you know, a perfect segue to this, and this is jumping ahead a couple minutes into the episode, but let's just talk about it right off the bat, the theme song. This is something that you guys actually put out about a week or so before the, uh, the debut of the actual show on Peacock. And I, you know, from what I saw, inevitably, it got a lot of attention, both positive, negative. I personally think it's, it's fantastic. I think that it's, um, yeah you know, uh, what could you do but just play off the original and bring it into 2020? That's exactly what it is. Um, but, you know, obviously there's people who are going to just be dissatisfied with anything except the original song, which totally yeah. would not fit the show. <laughs> so, no, and uh, you, yeah, so it felt like, 
it felt like both a, it felt like a missed opportunity to not do something to do something completely original that wasn't tethered to the old song because the old song is really iconic but it also felt kind of lazy and incorrect to just use the old song so um this you know when Lil Yachty said he was up for uh updating it that felt like a slam dunk just because you know he his music kind of has a sense of humor to it anyway and he had done things like this before like he had songs that sampled like Rugrats and Super Mario Brothers and like other 90s stuff so it felt like he would do a good job and, and I thought he really did yeah absolutely I, I, I agree and uh, you know, that's just one of many parts of this show that, you know, it's going to be debatable. It's like a Star Wars movie. If people care enough to dislike right. <laughs> your stuff immediately. Yeah, you only take it as a compliment if people yeah. care that much, right? <laughs> exactly. Now, I mean, as I said, I mean, I really did geek out over this and I made like micro level notes throughout the whole episode. And we don't have to hit every single point of episode number one. But um, I mean, let's just talk about this world that you've set up. And I think that uh, the first time we did talk back in our first season, uh, when you were on the show, we did make mention, you made mention of the fact that one of your influences was the Brady Bunch movie. Right. Um, and I look at I look at this world that you've set up and I realize that the commonality of it is that you've set up this situation where the say by the bell world can kind of make fun of itself but you've also set up the fact that it's not the entire world there's like this segment of the world that we've been seeing the entire early series and it was really just what goes on in bayside in that area but now we get to see how that conflicts the rest of the world just like the pretty bunch movies right right exactly i thought that was the... so it's a lot of fun to kind of just see you know, it, it's a great way to bring it into the real world without changing what we know and love about the world and the characters that we knew back then, because it's still there. Bayside is still almost exactly the same right. as it was all those years ago, right? which is, uh, it, it's a lot of fun. And that's um, like the that... reason to do it, right? Is it, you want to be able to walk into that world as you knew it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, it manages to walk this line um, of kind of tenderly making fun of itself a little bit, maybe poking yeah. fun at itself, but really to the point of parody. You know, it's still a show that you can take at face value. And the thing I like about it, as to say by the Bell Geek, uh, we'll get into it, is that the, the storyline continuity is totally on point. Like, you could truly believe that all these characters that we knew back then would be where you're showing them here today. Oh, cool. I'm mean, happy you feel that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, and good way to start then, because the first episode starts with a, uh, a campaign re-election video. Governor, not Governor Morris, Governor Zach, which I yeah. love. He calls himself Governor Zach. He's yeah. the governor of <laughs> California now. We find out he's been in this position for three years um and we kind of get the whole backstory in like this two minute commercial where he <laughs> and this is actually i think maybe my favorite part of the entire first episode <laughs> the fact that um his story shows him in bayside and marrying kelly kapowski and then becoming a uh a trial lawyer mm -hmm. showing him in, in his other role, Mark Paul Gosler uh, in Franklin and Bash. So I love right. that you just pulled in <laughs> continuity right. of an entirely different show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was a masterstroke. And, uh, you know, I, I also feel like this show has such a strong uh, vibe that is similar to that of Clueless. That I love oh, that's such a compliment. That's I that I think that is my favorite movie. I, love that movie. <laughs> I I I certainly when I think of that movie, which is just so great, my maybe my favorite scene from it is Breck and Meyer and his scene of accepting the award for most parties of the yeah. year. 
So yeah. to have him have that tiny involuntary cameo <laughs> yeah. as part of the Frankly Bad awesome. That would um, be so yeah, and we had to get, you know, we had to get Breck and Meyer to sign off on that. Obviously, it it had been the pilot, if you've noticed, is long. And it had been a longer thing where uh what I wrote in the script was it's like a clip from it. And we found I had never really watched Franklin and Bash, but when I went back and we looked through clips, it's like it's the perfect um, second act for Zach Morris because it's just about like two rock and roll lawyers. And so there, there were a bunch of clips, like there was one of him like just hitting on this like older woman in the jury. And there was one of him like making a woman take her top off in the courtroom. And so it was like, oh, it's so funny. We'll just put the whole clip in. But it did end up being a thing like we, we went with the picture because it was just like the episode was too long and um, it felt like faster was maybe subtler and funnier. Mm. Child screening. Yeah, <laughs> it was great. Um, so what we essentially find out through this is that Z uh, Zach is running through for re-election. Uh, we find out that he only got into politics as part of a scheme to uh, try to avoid paying a $75 parking ticket, which is yeah, very great. Yeah, it's great that he still calls them schemes, even a as an scheme. adult. He's pulling scheme. Yeah, uh, and he has kind of given away all the all the money. He's uh, he's caused this huge deficit in the education budget for all of California because he didn't know how to balance the budget and just found a solution on Google using Google, and uh, that was it. And he seems to be okay with it. Yeah. <laughs> And that too, very. There was an, there was an old joke that we also filmed that was like he had tickets to a Dodgers game and like the meeting meeting was running too long, so he so he just left or something. But like it was it was kind of I mean he's he's it was important that he wasn't so deplorable because the original wasn't was it didn't have malintent you know he just was uh, was kind of like a scam artist and and hated homework. You know, so he's still that guy. Yeah, and he even says in this video, he says, you know, he talks positively about the school experience. He talks about how his son, Mac, who we'll meet, um, goes to Bayside and he says that school is a time to evade schoolwork and torment your principal with no consequences, which was right. <laughs> clearly his experience. So um, again, it's just an example of, you know, you're not making fun of this world. This world continues to exist in the minds of these people who went to Bayside. Right. Um, and we see kind of what, what happens there. Um, and then we kind of go to the flip side and we meet two of our main players who are going to be coming to Bayside very soon, Aisha and Daisy, who go to Douglas High School currently, which is a, uh, a lesser income uh, area. It's a lower income yeah. area, certainly a lower budgeted school. Um, and they are about to find out that their school is going to be shut down <laughs> because the budget has just been destroyed by Governor Zach. Um, so it's really interesting to kind of see sort of the outside looking in. It's almost like a Truman Show sort of thing where it's this bubble. And now we're finally getting to meet the people who live outside this bubble of the Bayside area and what they think about it. Right. Now, was that sort of the, the basis of the idea for the show all along, the idea that we're going to just kind of create this totally different world and then kind of mash them up into Bayside and see the conflict? Yeah. I mean, you know, when I was thinking about at the very, uh, at the very, very outset of, of doing this, uh, you know, I kind of just thought back about, well, what do I like, about what did I love about the show and what would be fun to kind of mine for comedy. And, you know, part of what I loved about the show, and I think a lot of people, like I was in third grade probably when I was watching this. And so for me, it was like a really safe, sanitized kind of fantasy version of high school, um, you know, cause nothing bad ever happened there. It wasn't like 90210 where people were getting like, you know, roofied and pregnant and stuff. It's like the worst thing that would happen is, you know, you'd get addicted to caffeine pills for a day. So it, 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 you know, some of what, like the Brady Bunch, some of what 
I think drew people to it was how squeaky clean it was. And it felt like there was a fun opportunity to kind of tell a story about privilege. Obviously that wasn't what the original was about. It was a, you know, it was supposed to be like an all American high school in the Palisades. It wasn't supposed to be like gossip girl or 90210. It wasn't supposed to be about a fancy school necessarily. But, you know, if you think about high, life for high school students today, especially like post Corona, it's like, like, it's so hard and scary. And even without that, it's so hard and scary. And, you know, um, and you could imagine that at a place, you know, at, at a place like Bayside, at a place, an all American high school in the Palisades, life is very different for these kids than it would be for kids who come from a low funded school. And so it, it was, there was an interesting kind of thing to coming in from the POV of a char of a character who did not grow up, you know, did not grow up uh, going to Bayside, like kids who have real problems that can't just easily be solved in 22 minutes. It felt like it was, it would be cool to look at this place through that point of view. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I guess maybe that's what I was trying to get at before is that you created this amazing and really uh really true really believable reason as to why all these kids had no major problems and why it's always money all, right all, that's the only reason yeah. nobody ha when you don't have problems it's because you're rich you know it's because you're rich enough that's usually why you don't have problems you know exactly. and they do have problems like you know that later in the show you'll see like they have problems too like all kids do but coming in, mm -hmm. it felt like the reason Bayside is like this, why it's stuck in this kind of 90s paradise is because these kids are privileged. Yeah, well, let's, let's talk about all the characters real quick. You've, uh, you know, on one level, of course, you have to address the, the OG characters that you're bringing back into the fold. And, you know, some of them are there for the full-time, long-term, uh, as far as Mario Lopez coming back as Slater, Elizabeth Berkeley coming back as Jesse Spano. Uh, and then, of course, deciding how Zach and Kelly were going to factor into this, as we saw a little bit in the beginning. What was it? What was the decision based on in where all these characters landed? Because very believable that Zach Morris would become governor of California, just fueled yeah. by BS. Kelly, um, you know, we saw her just for a moment so far, but clearly, you know, they're still together. They're they're still married and she's supporting him yet has you know she, she's she's forced to say this bs line in the commercial and then you can actually see the, where she stops herself no uh, zach i can't say that so right. clearly the more level-headed one after all these years what about slater and jesse because they landed in very different positions yeah well so some of these decisions kind of came from the practicalities of who was available to us and for how many episodes and you know, Elizabeth and Mario uh, were able to be in all of them. And Mario has a previous really, he's on access. So he has a relationship with Universal. And um, and at the time, Mark Paul and Tiffany were series regulars on other shows. Mark Paul still is. And so they just were not going to be able to be in all 10 of them. And so, you know, that, uh, so for knowing that I had Jesse and Slater for all episodes, it felt like the, the kind of easiest thing to do was to make them both um, make them both work at Bayside. But um, I, I wanted them to be there for different reasons. Like Mario is kind of a, you know, a, a loser who never, who never kind of got over his glory days in high school. And he, uh, you know, he's kind of been there for a while, still trying to beat Valley. And, uh, you know, for Jesse, uh, and, and some of this was Elizabeth, I think very smartly was, you know, was like, we have to make sure Jesse isn't, Jesse like wasn't a failure. And, and it wasn't my intention that she would be. It's like, she's at the school for a different reason than he is. Like she's written a bunch of best-selling books about parenting and she got her doctorate and she has kind of, you know, become the girl that uh, she thought she was going to be, but she, her problems are elsewhere. She is sort of a terrible husband. Um, and, you know, and she is back at the school just to sort of help the kids and spend time with her son uh, that she kind of overparents. And so, you know, it, it felt like really organic to keep them 
you know, to keep them both at the school. And, you, you know, and it was also very important to me uh, that Zach and Kelly still be married because love isn't real if they've gotten a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> right. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I watched the show and I, and I thought to myself, and I've seen it actually written elsewhere as well, um, that Slater definitely gives off Johnny Lawrence vibes, just based on the popularity of Cobra Kai over the last oh, year. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. I, right. you know, I did watch the pi I did watch the pilot of that. I hope I can copy something. I did watch the pilot of that and I thought it was really good and well done. Yeah. And, and it was yeah. different than I expect. I guess people will hopefully feel that way about this too. Different than I expected. I, I thought it was like kind of like poignant and good. Yeah. And I, I think it's kind of the same. I think you're getting very much the same reaction for this show because it's got that nostalgia factor, but it's, it's a new direction. It's new thinking, it's new ideas and new ways to expand the characters. But Slater, you know, it's just kind of that lovable, you know, we all know the people who just didn't quite go very far after high school yeah and um, you know how they're dealing with that now that they're you know it's 20 years later or whatever the case may be um so it's fun to see slater kind of in that role and it feels very genuine because i mean look if you're going to be a say by the bell geek let's do it hard uh you can go back to that episode i think it was career day back in the original <laughs> I, 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 that's where i got the idea when i was watching through them i was like oh this is easy perfect yeah that's so funny and then there was like another one in college that kind of reaffirmed the same thing that it was like mm. he he kept skipping class to party or something. I was like, uh uh, this guy's going nowhere fast. <laughs> well, he is the uh, he's the athletic director of Bayside now, right? So yeah. he kind of oversees. I thought that was a really great choice because that means he can kind of have his hands in all the different sports, kind of like how he was like a starter in every sport it, back it in his exactly, high school. Exactly, that's what was so funny to me. He just was he was wrestling a lot, but also he was the captain of the football team and he and the captain of the basketball team, and he just won everything. Zach sometimes like ran track or something. They would say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they all won every award, won, you know, were the president of every club. Right. Um, now, of course, the second tier, even more important, is now how are we going to establish this entirely new cast? And right. uh, how are they going to relate to the old characters as well? Of course, we see, you know, Zach's kid, Mac Morris, I mean, pretty much a direct clone maybe even a heightened version of what yeah. zach used to be right <laughs> so that that's a lot of fun to see because zach wasn't typically challenged for being zach morris that's in right. the old series the way that mac morris is immediately challenged by the new students from douglas because right. it's uh yeah it's not necessarily a a great chemistry or great fit between him and people who don't come from that culture, culture right. clash. Um, so that, you know, that's an interesting choice. You mentioned, of course, Jesse Spano, um, her son uh, playing, uh, he is a football player, but I guess playing, you know, the, so my, at least as we meet him at, at first, kind of the dumb character of the group. Oh, like he's definitely dumb. He, the, the second episode is kind of goes into him on the football team a little bit more. Um, but he, uh, yeah, I, you know, it, there is something that was kind of funny to me about, uh, you know, he kind of looks like Slater and he's the captain of the football team, but his personality is just Kelly Kapowski, you know, and he is he's like his, mm. Kelly's only character traits were she was was she was nice and like uh, was sometimes uh, over emotional they would do jokes where she cried too often and she was kind of stupid you know like that that was sort of her whole deal so it was funny to me that you know to make a boy like that and also that he kind of fills the same role she did like he always is like walking around in half a shirt and two girls are fighting over him and stuff and that that felt like kind of funny. Well, that's what's funny about this whole cast is that you can see little bits and pieces of the old cast right. in the new generation, but they're distributed differently. Like you see Mac in his relationship with uh, Lexi, who is, yeah. you know, 
definitely a very new character, new type of character, of course, her story, um, transgendered, a reality TV star, uh, cheerleader, very popular, but her relationship with Mac is almost like Slater's with like Slater, Zach. Exactly. And, and she's so kind of fashiony like Lisa too, um, and sort of shallow uh, in that way. But yeah, exactly. Like she is, she and Ma Mac sort of have that, that same rivalry. Yeah, she even calls him preppy, which is right. <laughs> a great, clear throwback. Um, so it's a lot of fun to see to see those characters uh, sort of establish themselves, and I'm sure we'll see that more throughout the episodes. Um, and then, of course, we've got the Douglas crew. So you know, we meet Dave. Find out eventually. We come to learn that she's kind of the moral center of the show now. She's right. the voice that speaks directly to us like Zach used to do. So right. a very different morality, but um, right. she's even able to do the time out and pause things. Was there was there ever uh, like thought, like should we go as far as doing the time out thing or was that a big decision to go in that direction? It, it felt like you have to do it. Like there's certain things that it's like, well, if you're taking this on, we're not just gonna forget about it. You know, it, that was a weird thing that was part of that show and um you know and and I think when you give somebody that device uh you're really you're saying that they're the lead and you're also kind of saying is it what you're saying they're also kind of saying they're the POV of the show and and the you know the morality as you're saying of the show and so you know you you couldn't give that power to any of the Bayside kids because they're lunatics and, you know, and Daisy's really the person who's uh, the straight man coming in and is the person like the audience being like, what the fuck is wrong with this place? So, so she, you know, it felt like if anyone was going to have it, it's her. We had talked about, cause there's other episodes that uh, Zach is in and episodes that she's in with him and, and she does time out where he's nearby. Like there were conversations we had, we didn't really do it, do any of them, but like, I could totally see if there were subsequent seasons and we really, uh, you know, go out into the stratosphere of insanity. Like, yeah, exploring what the rules of that are. Does he still have it when she's like this? Can he walk by her? Like, is what are the, what what are the specifics of of who has the timeout? But we we do not we do not get that crazy in this first season. Well, I'm sure there's fan fiction happening as we <laughs> right. speak. <laughs> that. Um, I, so we we also meet Aisha, her friend from from Douglas, who is in the beginning the one who's skeptical about coming to Bayside. She's the one right. who doesn't want to leave the school she knows, um, but she assimilates and comes to love it real quick. She loves the the privilege. She she's really into uh, um, Jamie mm -hmm. <laughs> in like the first moment. Right. And um, she, uh, we find out that she was on the football team back at Douglas. And right. by the end of the first episode, she's now on the baseline football team. Right. Um, and then we come to Devante. Devante is a guy who uh, the others seem to know as a, a kid with a history of, you know, being a bit of a criminal, maybe. Yeah, I think um, he's like a little a, bit of a guy who does not follow the rules. I think, yeah. A little bit of a criminal. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think just kind of normal yeah. teenage stuff, but he, it, yeah. Oh, yeah, you saw the one, which episode is that? Is that three? You saw the one where he, right, has kind of a bad reputation for doing bad shit. Um, and yeah. they have yeah. sort of, and they make assumptions about, about, him. about him, right? Exactly, which is really what this first episode is all about. It's about, you know, all these people like breaking through these preconceived notions. You know, Devante, he has this thing back and forth all episode long with Slater. Slater right. is trying to uh, convince him to join the football team, just assuming right. that <laughs> he's got the physical goods, he's got right. the desire, just like he did back in the day, um, and being entirely wrong about it. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so everyone is kind of in a position where they have to follow the right path. They have to get past the discomfort of being in this new school and with these insane rich kids. And, you know, by the end, you know, Daisy, she finds the courage to pursue change and she does it by 
pursuing being the uh, the vice the or the student council, I guess the sophomore class. Sophomore president. class president, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which um, you know, it's funny. From when I watched it, you know, I'm breaking down everything in my head and I'm saying to myself, why aren't they freshmen? Because if this thing's a hit, you want as many years as possible. But I guess from a storyline perspective, you need some kind of history. The both of these you know, different groups need their history at their respective yeah, high I had never, yes, I, I had the same question. I had never done a high school show before, but when I looked at other high school shows like Dawson's Creek, I, I feel like a bunch, uh, almost anyone, uh, they all start as sophomores. And I think that is the reason because you want people to have shared history and like the Bayside kids are already their own thing uh, that these new kids are coming into as opposed to everyone's new and everything's up for grabs. So yes, that was the reason, but maybe we'll just do what Saved by the Bell did and they're just like in high school for another year and no one says anything about it and Tori comes. Yeah, they, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're waiting for- uh, and, Yeah, we'll just do another year. <laughs> absolutely, everybody stayed back. Yeah. Um, you know, and, uh, I, I actually was remiss in not mentioning what I thought was a really big choice for you guys. Uh, the principal, what kind of decision went into or what thought went into what this principal was going to be like? Because you could have just done like a building facsimile, but you really didn't. You went in a, in a bit of a different direction. Yeah, I mean, he's not he's not so different than Mr. Belding. He, you know, he... I. Anytime, like when you're putting together a show, like one of the things in your mind is like, well, this isn't just going to exist as a, a perfect script. Like you have to cast all these people and they have to be funny consistently. And, you know, one of my fears going into this was uh, casting six high school kids who are unknown and hilariously funny and good looking. And that would be, uh, would be willing to be on the show, you know? Um, and, and I think it's, you know, for me, I, I knew John Michael Higgins uh, from, he was on my other show on NBC. And so it just, I mean, it was such an easy thing in my mind that I was just kind of, uh, that I was like, well, you know, Mr. Belding, his whole function on the original was just sort of like, he was an imbecile, he, not, he was really funny. Like Dennis is a really funny, skilled comic actor, but like he was kind of a buffoon who was always getting sort of taken advantage of and screwed over by Zach and his friends. So, you know, a, a guy, having him be kind of this like put upon suit who's just trying to, you know, who sort of has no power above or below him. He, uh, you know, it felt like it, it would be really funny to write a part like that for, John Michael Higgins and you know I knew he'd be really funny and I knew he'd do it <laughs> so say yes so um I just kind of wanted to work with him again and he's so good I feel like he brings a little bit of a bit more gravity to the role and maybe yes. you know we'll see how that evolves over the episodes he's a character but, right like you know, Mr I know what you're saying like Mr Belding never changed because and it was a you know it was a multicam and a uh you know teen morning multicam too so like no uh you know it, it not shitting on the writers or anything but like he never changed where like throughout the season like yeah, like John Michael Higgins has an arc where he is, you know, sort of this this doormat who gets stepped on by everybody at this, yeah. like he doesn't get to make any decisions about what happens at the school. And then kind of by the end of the season sort of puts his neck out for, you know, for the kids in a way that he wouldn't have when we first meet him in the pilot. And he also is a that mentor, that like scene where he kind of mentors Daisy is so sweet. Like he, you know, he really is is so good in it. She is too. He's capable. He's a he's a bit more of a capable, I think, uh, uh, like you said, a mentor or a principal than than Mr. Pilding was ever portrayed right. as. Despite all the crap that he deals with, he can still be there for the kids and lend solid advice and and actually be a role model, which right. I think is a, right. a nice thing. Um, yeah. So you know, just going into the episode again. So. You know, we get to this point where, you know, everyone is now going to Bayside and they're all working out their differences. They're all, you know, figuring out the other side and how things work. And, you know, in the end, as we said, we see Daisy kind of rise to the occasion of getting past the, 
I guess her her own former moral code, which was she didn't want to become the the president of the Spurs unless she earned it, and then she instead won it through kind of chicanery, you might say, yes. with uh, yes. <laughs> Mac Morris. They won it for her, yeah. Hey Lexi, they kind of they, they kind of pull a scheme, a Bayside scheme, and get her to win the election instead. And instead, she is uh, she decides to just take it so that she can make change because it is very strongly recognized all over the place that change is needed here. <laughs> and she's going to spearhead that. We see Aisha, you know, kind of shed her concerns about her image to join the football team, and. Uh, and then we see Devante, not a football player, not his destiny at all. Instead, he shows up for uh, the audition for the school musical and just rocks it. And I love the um, I love the very end of the episode because it's him singing uh, The Greatest Love of All, which <laughs> if you ever watch American Idol, I, I mean, I used to watch it back in the day and all they ever used to talk about is that you never tackle a Whitney Houston song. I so know. I know. props to you guys. A hard one. It was nice. It was it was very nice. It was lovely. Um, oh, but it, it's a great montage where you see everyone else rising to the occasion. And then in the end, I think it was a great character building moment. He just looks at the the uh, the, the couple of teachers who are uh, auditioning him and he just goes, OK, we good. And they go, <laughs> yeah. And he, <laughs> he goes, OK, it just like walks off because so it's not one of those easy yeah but it, you know you you almost expect that cheesy like oh my god you have real talent do i really and like you know emotion and tears but no he just knows it he's real good and he knows it and that's you know, as we'll see that's kind of Devante is which is fun he's also the guy um and i I, I'm sure you're conscious of using him in, in this sort of way. He's the guy who points out a lot of the ridiculousness that you see, whether it's the Max or, or anywhere. Like he's the guy who's just like, oh, like, you know, to like to Slater, like you're wa you're sitting backwards in a chair. I've never actually seen anyone right. do that. Right. Life. Exactly. And and you know, we were very conscious of we're sort of because of the premise, those three kids are coming in. And it's like you don't want that they don't get to have any fun and that the three of them, and they do, they get to have a lot of fun that the three of them are just always like, this place is weird. Why are you acting like this? And then Mac and Lexi and Jamie are the ones who are, you know, going on, going on adventures every week and they're sitting by. So, you know, uh, we just, we, we were very, we tried to be very thoughtful about that and make sure that, uh, you know, all the characters kind of got to have Bayside fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of, it's a lot of fun to watch. And I think it's, uh, you know, anytime you can get a good, like 30 ish minute show that you can binge, that is such a sweet spot for me personally. I think it's, yeah. it's a throwback feel to be able to just watch something and have it not cost like an hour, an hour of your just, time. Just man, never get, I, you know? I, the last show I was on was in, I, I, ran this um this remake of four weddings and a funeral for hulu and it was an hour long and it was the first hour long i've ever uh been on and like boy it is even to work on it <laughs> it's like every every Ooh. script takes so long to read every cut you're watching for forever it's just like so it's so to work on it is so tedious and the, the feeling you know if it's a really good show obviously you know, I'm watching Fargo right now and it's like, they have episodes that are just like two and a half hours long and you don't mind it. But like, yeah, for comedies, like they, they don't want to be more, they don't want to be more than 25, 26 minutes in reality, like our pilots longer, but you know, we try to keep them tight. That's great. And I think that, you know, for those of you who are just checking out the show today or recently um i'm sure you at least have the temptation to binge and binge and binge and not to compare again to cobra kai but it was such a big hit exact same formula 10 episode seasons uh about a half an hour per show and i think that was just such a perfect formula for people going like oh i like this oh wait i just spent my weekend watching yeah. the whole thing and yeah. now i'm done yeah is that what you that that's what you expect to happen here i, I hope I so like i hope it's bingeable and fun and you know we don't and you know nothing 
that was our intention. Nothing overstays its welcome. Uh, it's pretty, you know, I think it's pretty digestible. Like you can sit and watch five pretty easily in a, in a sitting. And it moves so fast, the fast paced, I mean, obviously right. very reminiscent of 30 Rock that you were right. such a big part of. Is Was that a decision for you? This is the way it needs to run. We need to roll this out, bang, 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 bang. That's the pace we're gonna keep. You know, I don't know if it's so much of a decision as, you know, uh, my lack of talent. Like I write one, you know, I write one way and I like jokes like that. That's what makes me laugh. And I like lots of jokes and, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think I adjusted a little bit. It, like every show you're on, you kind of adjust to what the thing wants to be. But 30 Rock and Great News and the Mindy Project, they, they you know, they all share, uh, you know, some DNA. They all like uh, sort of have a, a kind of type of joke and a pace to them. And they exist, you know, and at least for 30 Rock and Great News exist a little bit outside of reality sometimes and are a little absurd and stuff. That that just is what I like to write. So um, yeah, I, I don't know if I can write a Chernobyl, you know what I'm saying? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I can write a completely different kind of thing or want to. Yeah, we don't want to watch those anyway. This yeah. is what we like. So. What did the guy, the guy who wrote Chernobyl, he, he had some other crazy credit, right? He, he like wrote, like I, I want to say he wrote like the um, he wrote like the scary movies or something. That that can't be true. But he wrote some comedy or something. <laughs> I remember. Reading I might be completely wrong. I'll look it up. I'm guessing it was Weekend at Bernie's too. Yeah, he That's wrote. Right. Just Weekend at Bernie's three, right. and then Chernobyl, and that. Yeah. It. <laughs> Tracy, um, I know you're super busy. This is such an, I, I mean, it's got to be an exciting time for you. So I'm, really? I'm so yeah. happy that you were able to come back on the show and My talk pleasure. to us about it. I think people are in the middle of binging. Why don't, why don't we leave with this? Um, assuming that people are doing what we promoted and asked them to do, which is check out the first episode and then listen to this and then go on your binging. What are some highlights that you want people to look for as they go into episodes two, three, and then all the way down the line? Um, you know, each each episode uh, is, it, you know, ha has more of kind of the thing we were trying to hit on in the pilot, which is, uh, you know, kind of the fun of Bayside and those little Easter eggs and nostalgia from the original show with just sort of funny, more relatable high school stories. Um, I think if you are a huge fan of Saved by the Bell, um, their episode, uh, episode eight is like our, is our big kind of homecoming episode. That is like the one that is the most packed, I would say with kind of old Saved by the Bell stuff. And, you know, and throughout, like it is worth kind of watching and looking closely because we, you know, we did sort of take pains to um, add in little uh, like secret throwbacks to the show that I think only only on careful viewing um, of those later episodes uh, can you fully appreciate. Uh, I mean, whatever, it's not like, <laughs> it's not like some intricate riddle, but. <laughs> no, we're gonna make it an intricate riddle, don't you worry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, Tracy, thank you so much for being on the thank show. Thank you it's so been much. Fun to watch the show. It's been fun to talk about it. And uh, good luck. We we already have our fingers crossed for season two. Great, great. Thank you so much. Cool. All right. Have a great night. All right. Bye, Jay.